So I want you this morning to take just a, a moment or two, if you would, and think about the toll this last year has taken on you, on your family, or even on those loved ones that you have. I think many of us will agree to some degree or another that this last year has been really tough. We've had to deal with a brand new disease that left us with a lot of uncertainty, a lot of wondering what was going to happen. It provoked and inspired some fear or some anger in some of us. We've had to experience a form of isolation that we've never, at least most of us have never experienced, where we weren't able to be with our loved ones. I think specifically of those people that were in our nursing homes and were unable to see family and friends and were basically stuck in their rooms. We also witnessed humanity at some of its worst in this past year. We saw people hoard resources when people needed them. We saw people loot things that didn't belong to them. We saw cities burned, capital assaulted, and we've lived in a constant state of heightened political tension this entire year. And so friends, it's taken its toll on all of us to some degree or another. But friends, I'm going to say that this just isn't new this year, but rather I think that this is a trend that has been growing for some time. Because if we go back and we look at statistics, largely people, especially Americans, are becoming more and more unhappy each year. We see more and more violence as people take action or take the lives of other people. We have more and more people going on antidepressant drugs and medication. And we see more and more people take their lives every year. So how is it that the most prosperous, most abundant, most free nation in the world is so unhappy that people feel they need to do these types of things? Personally, I think it's because we're struggling with a crisis of hope. Okay? And if we go to Star Wars, Yoda gives us some very wise, this wise bit of wisdom. Well, that made a lot of sense. Um, gives us this bit of wisdom where he says, fear leads to anger, anger leads to hate, hate leads to suffering. Right? And friends, we've seen an awful lot of fear in the last year, and we've seen an awful lot of people get angry, and we've seen a lot of people move to hatred. I mean, it just makes me shudder to see the way some people have treated other people, just the amount of sheer, even if it's just verbal hate, that they just seem to spew on anyone who doesn't seem to agree with them on every little specific thing, and it happens on both sides of the political spectrum, and it's just gross. And so, friends, we continue to hurt each other. But again, this is a symptom of the fact that in many ways we're losing some of the things that are most important to us and it's causing a crisis of hope. And so one of the things that we continue to wrestle with is we continue to see many of the grand narratives, many of the meta narratives, many of the institutions and things that have always provided us with assurance, with a sense of safety, and we find that by certain groups, okay? How many times over the past year have I talked to you about my concern for the decline that continues in the church? And we continue in this country or in the Western civilization in general to see a, a decline in people who continually move away from religion, right? But friends, I truly believe that we are religious beings by nature. And if we choose to move away from religion, then we're left with this void that needs to be filled by something. But what is it? Because obviously the void that we want to be filled is being filled by things that are not actually fulfilling us. Most often it leads us to nihilism and narcissism because in place of God, we just institute ourselves and think we are the center of of the universe and that all of life should revolve around us or we move into nihilism that basically just says you know what there is no meaning in anything everything is just relative 
So who cares what you do? Who cares what I do? I get to decide what's right and wrong, what's best for me. And what's the point of even talking with each other if nothing really matters anyway? And so friends, we have this void that just is desiring to be filled and it's created almost this ravenous feeling within each of us. And it gets all the harder when we see things like family, community, church. We find those institutions that gave us strength and support. We watch them continually crumble around us. And so, friends, we're in need of some hope. And today we're going to take a look at another Star Wars um, video clip. And one of the things I want us to remember is that Star Wars, in many ways, is a story of hope. I think that's honestly why the movie series has been so successful. It's a story about a group of ragtag heroes that managed to rise up and do something simply because they have the hope that there's something better out there, that life can be different for them on the other side of this. All right? And friends, I think that many of us have that same desire. We look at the lives we have, we look at the way things are going and say, you know what, life just shouldn't be like this. There's something different, something that I believe is implanted in us by God to say, you know what, I created you for more and better, but this stuff is broken, you're broken, and it needs to be fixed. So the video clip I'm going to show you is from Disney's, one of Disney's newer movies called Rogue One, um, and it's a, it's a scene where the, this Young Rebel Alliance is coming together. They've just learned that the Death Star has been created. I mean, well, some people believe it. Other people just think it's a myth just used to lure them out. And it's interesting to see the conversations from the different figures in the cast and how they relate to them. And I think that it speaks very highly to some of the things that we've witnessed of people who want to just go out and fight, people who are scared to death and think they should just run away and hide, and then those that want to take intentional, deliberate action. So go ahead, we'll watch this clip, and we'll talk briefly about it in a moment. We need some sound. We'll see how good their acting really is, because if you can get the gist of it just with the acting, then you know it was good, right? <laughs> and there's not even any subtitles for you. Everything based on what? The testimony of a criminal. The dying words of her father, an Imperial scientist. But oh, don't forget the Imperial pilot. My father gave his life so that we may have a chance to defeat this. So you've told us. If the Empire has this kind of power, what chance do we have? What chance do we have? The question is what choice? Run, hide, plead for mercy, scatter your forces. You give way to an enemy this evil with this much power, and you condemn the galaxy to an eternity of submission. The time to fight is now. Yes. Every moment you waste is another step closer to the ashes of Jeddah. What is she proposing? She's nothing else. Send your best troops to Scarif. She sense. Send the rebel fleet if you have to. We need to capture the Death Star plans if there's any hope of destroying it. You're asking us to invade an Imperial installation based on nothing but hope. Rebellions are built on hope. There is no hope. I say we fight. I say the rebellion is finished. I'm sorry, Jim. Without the full support of the council, the odds are too great. Must stop. 
scatter the fleet. <laughs> you gonna watch it again? All right. <clears throat> So anyway, go back and watch that full scene if you want. But the beautiful thing about it, and spoilers to you that have never seen the movie, but what happens then is that this young girl basically decides that, look, the risk is too great not to pursue action. Because what does it mean if this alliance decides to just depart and leave? Right? The entire galaxy comes under the submission and the oppression of the... founded in the first place, was to throw off this tyranny, this evil that was um, going forth. And so it's, it's a really interesting movie, and I love that last line where she says, rebellions are built on hope, that again, there's something better out there that we can expect to have, or we should expect to have a better life. Now, we're going to turn for a moment, and we're going to look at um, some some of the biblical story. And one of the things that I think is interesting is that we, we believe that hope is something very different than the world views hope. Again, the world generally tends to view hope either in terms of fate, we just kind of think, well, this is just going to happen and we hope for the best. Or again, that there's this intentional expectation that, that hope has a purpose, that things are indeed going to get better because God said they will get better. And so Paul in his um, letter to the Corinthians in what often is referred to as the love chapter talks about the three things that are eternal. Okay, And he says, these three things will last forever. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. Okay, And so, again, one of the interesting things is that oftentimes our faith is something that looks both forward and backward, right? We look back, we see all of the promises that God has fulfilled and that the things that God is doing, and it gives us this hope, this expectation, then that things will continue to move forward, right? And then love is sort of this present emotion that we love in the here and now, and we, again, give us hope, all right? Um, now, every time I read this, this verse, I for some reason, I always think of the mythological story um, of Pandora's box. Have you ever, you guys remember that one? Um, and basically what happens is that the Greek god Prometheus goes and steals fire from the other gods and gives it to humanity as sort of a, 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 the ability to do science and for them to go on and create and do different things. And as a result, Zeus punishes him and gives him this terrible punishment um, that occurs every single day, and it just keeps happening over and over. And then Zeus creates woman, and she gives woman this jar, and inside this jar is all the woes of the earth, disease, suffering, pain, death, all of these things. And the little Pandora manages to open the jar, and all of this stuff gets spilled out into humanity, and she quick tries to shut the jar, but what's left in there? Hope, right? Only hope remains stuck in her jar. And again, folks, this is what I, what I think is so cool because this is where Christianity or Judeo-Christian belief differs from even the Greek understanding because that story was for them a story about how to understand suffering in the world, right? And, and even today, it still has an effect on us because when we say, you know what, Sure hope we don't open a can of worms, right? It's that it comes from our understanding of that story. Even stories like Mary Shelley's Frankenstein come from this idea that humans can go too far, and if hope remains in the jar, then humanity is in big trouble. And so for the Greeks, they believed in this fatalism and the idea that their entire life was bound up in fate, and they just hoped that fate came out on their side. But Judeo-Christian belief says, uh-uh, that's not the way it is. Fate has nothing to do with this. Rather, you can have faith, hope, and love, and as you interact in these, yes, you might have suffering, but there's an expectation that somewhere, at some time, things are going to get better, that God is going to intervene, and things will change. So I want us to think about that as we continue to go forward this morning. 
a book by John Eldridge called All Things New. And if you have never experienced John Eldridge, I would encourage you to read him. He's a fascinating guy. He, I love the way he writes. I've read numerous, um, many of his books, and I find them just absolutely fascinating. But in this book, he goes through and he talks about this very idea, this idea that we need to have a hope. And that we, again, are struggling with this crisis of hope and what we um, might do. And so today, just as we are at the end of our Star Wars series, so we're going to go to the end of our scriptures and we're going to look at some verses from the book of Revelation, um, chapter 21, verses 1 through 8. So if you have a few Bible, you want to follow along, I invite you to um, do that, okay? And so here John, is, John, the author of the book of Revelation, is, is having a vision and after all of sort of this, um, all of these events have happened that he has witnessed in this vision of the end times, he says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. Now, Again, friends, one of the, one of the things that I, I feel like people really struggle with is, is the idea of what happens to us when we die, right? I mean, isn't that one of the profound questions that, that we need to ask as human beings? Like, what happens to us? Is there an afterlife? Does it matter what we do on this earth or once my life is spent, is it just over? Again, this idea that many of the grand narratives that we have are falling and the people are seeking answers, but they're seeking those answers in the wrong spots. And partly, I think we're to blame for this. As Christians, we don't do a very good job of explaining or telling or even encouraging people with a positive picture of what the afterlife is going to look like, right? I mean, how many of us... Well, we just say, well, we're going to go to heaven, and somebody looks at us like, that has got to be the most boring thing ever, because they think they're going to be sitting on a hard pew like this, singing hymns for the rest of eternity. Or they think they're going to be sitting on a cloud, playing a harp for the end of their days, right? I mean, does that seem very appealing to anyone? And so, friends, I don't believe that that's the way it's going to be, and I'm not trying to diminish heaven, Right? Because heaven is, we can't even put words to what heaven is like, to the beauty that is in it. But our limited imagination sometimes just hurts our representation of it. But also, we need to remember that there's this promise that Jesus will come again. And after all of these things happen, things are going to be very different. And so here, John says, the old earth and the old heaven have passed away and a new one comes into being. Now friends, we don't know specifically if God is just going to completely recreate the earth. I find that rather unlikely. I think that he'll just recreate and remold this earth into what he originally intended it to be. Right? Because I mean, why would he give us an experience on this earth and for us to enjoy many things just for us to not to, to be put in something totally foreign and different. Maybe, but I doubt it. I mean, how many of you have a special spot here in this earth where you can go and you just feel like, wow, I feel so close to God in this spot? You know? Yeah. And for each of us, it's just interesting because I can go 100 miles from here, a place that I've gone my entire life, this little podunk town with one gas station on the corner. If you drive by, you miss the entire town. But when I go there and I camp and I'm in, in the nature setting, I feel like I'm just one step away from heaven. I feel closer to God than any place else in my life, and I'm just absolutely at peace. And so again, there's this promise that things are going to be made new, that this world is broken. We see the results of this, but it's going to be remade. It's going to be made new, and where it's going to become paradise again. And so in many ways, the end becomes the beginning, okay? And so those two things pass away, and we're given this brand new earth. And I invite us to think about what that means. What are we going to do? How will we live in it? What will we do there? And hopefully we'll spend a little time answering those in just a minute. 
And then John goes on and he says, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. Again, friends, doesn't this just echo of the Garden of Eden story? The fact that God literally walks among his people. He literally lives with them. They get to experience and be in relationship with him every day. Again, this, the holy city, this new Jerusalem, I believe, is the church, right? Because in numerous places in Scripture, it tells us that the church is Jesus' bride, Right, And so again, this same imagery of the holy city, of the church coming down. And so essentially heaven comes down to earth, to this new earth to dwell upon it and live in relationship with God and with each other. And so friends, think about all of those people that we have lost along the way. We've lost a couple people in both of our churches even within this last month, or at least we've celebrated funerals for them within that time. But think about our spouses, our parents, for some of you children that you've lost along the way. And think about the reunion that may come as you now come to this new place and you get to live in a place where, guess what, there is no more death, there is no more corruption, and you will never have to say goodbye to those people ever again. And again, imagine what it will be like to be in God's presence every day, to walk alongside Jesus, to hear the things that Jesus will say, and to hear the stories of other people. Now, John Elridge does a beautiful job in his book of, of creating in, in this idea of this grand feast that will all come together and will always celebrate the stories of those who come through Christ and come to live in this new spot. And so think about the, the celebration, the reception that you'll receive as you enter into this and people long to hear your story and you're celebrated for the ministry and the work that you've done here on earth. And imagine yourself being wrapped up in a big hug by Jesus. Now some of you say, Josh, that doesn't seem very reverent to me, but you know what? Jesus didn't go and die on that cross for no reason. And so if you think that a hug is a little bit too much, I encourage you to rethink some of your theology because I expect to get a great big hug from Jesus when my time comes. And I long to see those people that I have lost along the way. And so he goes on and he says he will wipe every tear from their eye. There will be no more death, no more mourning, no more crying, no more, no more pain. For the old order of things has been passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said to him, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down. These words are trustworthy and true. And again, friends, there is our hope. If God says, Write these things down because they're true. Guess what? We can stand then on those promises and believe, have that hope, that expectation that indeed these things will come. Now, John Eldridge makes a a very important point in his book, and he says, you know what? So much of the human life, so much of the human experience is loss. We're constantly losing or saying goodbye to so many things in our lives. And not that there aren't good things along the way, but you never get to stay with them for any amount of time before they're over. And pretty soon you're saying goodbye to your childhood, goodbye to your adolescence, goodbye to different things, goodbye to the people you love. Even the things that you thought would bring you joy, those material possessions, many of them too pass away and you lose them because they break down or they cease to bring you the joy that you thought. Well, friends, just imagine what it will be like when there is no more brokenness among us in humanity. There is no more sickness. We no longer have these broken down (coughs) bodies that fail us as we age and get older. But we're given something new. And so creation is restored and recreated. Our human bodies are recreated. 
and we get to enjoy paradise with God. Now, many of you might sit here and question like, well, what does it mean? I mean, what are we going to do there? I mean, it sounds kind of cool that we have this new earth, we have this new body. Well, guess what, friends? Again, my belief is that we're going to do some of the same things that we love to do. I mean, why did God give us certain gifts here on earth if we're not going to get to use them in this new place, right? And so one of the things that I hope to do is I finally hope to catch up on my reading, right? Like I just get to sit there with books and read all the books I didn't get to read in this life. I believe Kyle and Aaron will be sitting there playing and making music. You know, probably the the toughest role will be Ben and David because they're going to have to learn a new profession, (laughs) right? So maybe, maybe Ben will be working on his golf swing and David will be sitting on the pontoon fishing somewhere. I don't know. But, but think about that. I mean, think, think of what it's like to be able to go and do the things you've most wanted to do, those things that God has just put special on your heart, and to be able to go and do those and to do them for eternity. Or heck, who knows, maybe you want to go learn a new skill. You've got all the time in the world to go do it. And you get to do it perfectly. You've got the best teachers to live by. You get to do it with the people that you love and that you care about. And so then Jesus says, it is done. I am the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. And so friends, again, this isn't just something that's temporal. It's something that is eternal. We're given the gift of salvation, the gift of eternal life with God. And again, that goes right back to the beginning of the story. And where Adam and Eve were denied to eat from the tree of life, so God freely now gives us this living water and says, guess what? From now on, you'll thirst no more and I've given you the very thing your soul desires. Drink as much as you want. And so friends, this should be a celebration, a celebration of hope. And I'm going to show you one final Star Wars clip and this comes from the end of Return of the Jedi and and it's basically um, the Emperor has been defeated and, and we see victory in the original series. And so I'm going to invite you to to watch this, but also watch for the symbolism that is in there because it's it's really interesting and powerful.
Yeah, move it. <laughs> Oops, and then I went too far. Dale, can you move it back one? There we go. Oh, gosh, now we're fighting each other again. There. Sorry about that, folks. But I love how that scene from the movie starts with the old and the corrupt being burned away, right? We see Darth Vader, the evil, the brokenness being burned away, and we move into this celebration of all people. And now, granted, this is in a galaxy far, far away and a long time ago, but think about what it'll be for us when our time comes and we get to go to experience heaven, when we get to go experience this new earth. I think those celebrations will pale in comparison to the celebration that we're going to have as we get to walk into the presence of Jesus, right? Now, there's one other, one other part that I think we need to think about because, again, Star Wars, despite being a series of hope, has some major flaws, right? Because what happens in the next series? Does the peace, does the celebration last? No, it doesn't. Because a new threat arises, and that's the problem with Star Wars religion, with this idea of a dualistic system. The fact that you have a light and a dark side, and that they need to be in balance, because it means that one is always going to grow in proportion to the other. So there's always going to be conflict. But not so in our story. We know that at the end of the day, God is going to win supreme, and that Satan will be defeated forever and will not rise again and cause problems but one day it's going to be over and we have the hope and the assurance that this will come true now there are some things that we need to do yet while we are here right we're not just called to long for the future and in fact people in the early church were off, often worried about this because they, one, either expected Jesus to come back within their own lifetime or they were so excited to go to heaven that they were often willing to commit what was called holy suicide where they just thought that if they could end their lives, they could go to be with God immediately. Now, it's kind of interesting how we've come almost a full 180 degrees, right? Where many of us worry more and care more about preserving our lives than the thought of, willingly giving our lives for God. But we're called to do something while we're still here on this earth, and for that, and that is for us to persevere. <clears throat> and so as we look at verses 7 and 8, it says, those who are victorious will inherit all of this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. But to the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts and idolaters and all the liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur, and this will be the second death. And so, friends, we are each given a choice, a choice to follow God and to grow and to do the things that God calls us to do, or we can deny God and then suffer the consequences of that. Now, many people often say, well, how is it that such a good and loving God could ever send anyone to hell? But friends, is God really sending them to hell? I don't think so. I think that's their choice, right? Because if God is truly all good and loving, which he is, he gives humanity the ability to decide because God didn't want automatons that gave shallow worship just because he was God. He gave us the free will, the choice to say, you know what, I love you so much that I'm going to allow you to reject me because I value that and I want you to be in true relationship with you. And so friends, I would counter that argument and say, why would a good and loving God, if you couldn't stand him in this life, why would he ever submit you to a life with him forever and eternity, right? So it's your choice whether you want to go to heaven, whether you want to experience this life, or whether you will just go down a path that leads someplace else, a path that I believe leads to destruction, all right? And again, our culture struggles with this. Our culture doesn't like the thought that there are consequences, especially consequences of this nature, but that's just the way that it is. And so the choice is up to us. But we also have the responsibility then to go out and to give that invitation, to share the message with other people. And we need to 
also act out of this sense of urgency. <clears throat> Man, this clicker is causing me problems, guys. All right, and so in Matthew 24, Jesus says, however, no one knows the day or the hour when these things will happen, not even the angels in heaven or the Son himself, only the Father knows. So you too must keep watch, for you don't know what the day, or you don't know the day that your Lord is coming. You also must be ready all the time for the Son of Man will come when it's least expected. And so friends, again, we're to have this urgency, this idea, this expect, expectancy that Christ is coming again. And we need to be on our guard, to be watching for it, not to be idle with our time. You know, I'll, I have one just brief story and then I'll, I'll leave you with the action steps because I've run long. But you know, I had an interesting conversation with my son this week because he too was just like, he thought he had all this time left in his life. And I mean, every young kid should believe that, right? They always think they're just invincible and that they've got all this time. But anyway, one of his friends said that he was going to die at a certain time. And he, my, my son just really struggled with that. And it opened up an interesting conversation for us to say, you know what? Well, you could die at any time. You know, you're not guaranteed tomorrow or the next day or the next week or even the next year because God could call us home at any time and we need to be ready. We need to be doing the things that God calls us to do and not putting off what needs to be done today till tomorrow or the next day. And as someone who is a procrastinator, that's kind of tough for me to handle sometimes, right? But think about what happens when we do. We miss those opportunities that we could be sharing and doing the things God calls us to do. And we may too have to suffer the consequences for that inaction, for putting things off. And so friends, I invite us today to move and pursue this hope that God gives us, to look forward to His sucking coming and to have the assurance of that. But I also invite us in this life to be diligent, to be in a sense, or have a sense of urgency and to continually move forward as God directs us. So I've got a couple of action steps for you. Most of this is reflection. But think about our opening discussion. How is your hope these days? Where is your hope these days? And how does the knowledge that God will make all things new provide hope for you both during your life here on earth and in the future to come. God bless. At this time, I would invite us to prepare our hearts and minds to move into